You know, when you look at Israel, that's quite a checkered history. The past is not perfect. It's a nation of people. And some of these people did not do real well. Abraham, the father of the faithful, the father of Israel and many of the Arabic nations and many other people, uh, he was promised that his seeds were going to be more numerous than the stars to count. So this is a man that uh, offered his wife over <laughs> to uh, the king's harem. Uh, I mean, that's something I don't think that I could ever do for any reason. I think I'd rather die than to give my wife away to another man. But, he, you know, he had his moments. I mean, him and Sarah decided to have a child through the handmaiden, Hagar. And Ishmael was born, and we've all seen the dynamics of that playing out even to this day. Israel went into bondage after brothers uh, sold their brother Joseph into slavery. And they, they re got reward. Ten brothers, 40 years of judgment per 400 years in Egypt. Delivered by Moses, the hand of God. And they came into the wilderness and complained and murmured. And even though they'd been delivered from Egypt, and the power of Egypt was destroyed behind him. They sometimes wanted to return. And boy, they had problems. And God and them had more than a few occasions that they got into trouble. And they ended up wandering for 40 years in the desert, dying off because of their lack of faith to go into the promised land. Because it would be tough. There was giants to conquer. And then they get in and they conquer. And then... Book of Judges talks about how every man did what seemed right in their own eyes because there was no king in Israel. They had no standard. Yes, God was their king, but they didn't recognize it. And God would raise up uh, judges and get uh, them out of the problems and deliver them. But as it progressed on, it just seemed like even the judges got worse. So we see King Saul. We see King David both failed. We see the nation of Israel falling again into idolatry and then going into captivity. And uh, the final warning was that they would eventually be destroyed and chased out and scattered to the four winds only to be brought back because God is full of love and compassion. He's going to keep his covenant even though Israel doesn't deserve it. And from this, Messiah would come and as Gentiles, we get to come into the benefit of Israel. So we get to be partakers of all the promises of God that are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. So Israel and the church are, you know, tied together to the word of God and to what God has done through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here's the thing that we've got to grasp. All of this history, this Old Testament history, might seem boring to some people. My dad found the Old Testament dry. He loved the New Testament. But the early church didn't have a New Testament. They had teachings from the apostles who sat at Jesus' feet, but they also used the Old Testament to explain, because that's what Jesus did. He took and showed them from the prophets how Messiah must suffer, how all this was to come together. So in the book of Hebrews, it said all this was written beforehand for our benefit so that we wouldn't get into the same trouble. And the examples and the warnings are given to us. Don't, don't get into the same trouble. So as Christians, we come into the kingdom of God, delivered from the powers of the world of darkness. And sometimes we want to go back. Is that problematic? And sometimes we end up spending a, a large amount of time in a, of our life wandering in the wilderness. Some people get to it quicker than others. Some have the faith of Joshua and Caleb and Willie you and the promised land is taking on those giants in our life, those things, those must be conquered, those mindsets and, and the appetites of the flesh and other things to be conquered and subdued because Jesus Christ is Lord. He's our king. And as long as we maintain that, we'll do what's right. But when we forget and we start deciding what's 
we believe in our own sight and our own understanding is right and everyone doing what they think is best and they forget the kingship the lordship of jesus we get in trouble and so many people today would like to negate the word of god because well just like israel they didn't want that they wanted to be like the world they wanted to do the things that god said don't do because these things are destructive to your life and not just to your life, but to your children and grandchildren and to your neighborhoods and to your communities and to your nation. These things are destructive, so don't do them. Don't give the enemy grounds in your life. I remember uh, talking with my mentor, Pastor Reverend Melvin Turner. He's more of an evangelist than a pastor, though he did pastor sometimes. Uh, that he, he found it interesting that so many Christians had sicknesses and problems and God healed some and others, they weren't healed. What was it, faith or the lack thereof? Well, sometimes he said he thought, but he found it interesting how people voted often uh, indicated the problems in their life. See, when we put the government and uh, as for over as our pocketbook gets benefited by our pocketbook only, we get in trouble. When we take and we do the things that God says thou shall not do and vote for that, we're at war with God. We, we walked outside the covenant blessings that he's promised that he's going to give us blessings. But if we violate covenant and leave it, then all the sicknesses, disease, and the curses we're subject to, or they're going to come into our life, and not only into our life, but into our children's life and, and grandchildren, into our communities, into our cities, into our states, our nations, into our world. So we have to be willing to repent of our ways and change our ways and consistently work on keeping the enemy out of our life and out of our thinking and out of our fellowship. We can't be like the world and accept it. God to be our friend. He says, if any man's a friend of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's an enemy of God. That's, that's the way it really is in, in the reality of the dimension of the kingdom of God. And so many people want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be able to be forgiven and go to heaven, but they also want to look like the devil so many days out of the week feed the appetites of the flesh and think and respond in ways they shouldn't and live as they shouldn't. And then wonder why they're having the consequences with their, their spouses or with their children or their grandchildren are having problems or all the things that are going wrong in church. Why is God not answering my prayers? Why am I having the economic upheaval? So if we're often willing to say, okay, God, what's going on and pray about it and look at the word, we'll often find that there's something maybe needing to be corrected in our way. Repentance is a correction. It's stopping what we're doing that's not right. Okay, stopping it. Turning from it, turning towards God and saying, I want to acknowledge that I've done wrong and I want to repent of that. I want to forsake that. I want to denounce that. I want to turn away from that unright way of going, the unrighteous of it, and turn to your righteousness in Christ and begin to walk in faith again in obedience to you. We forget the power of obedience. God doesn't want us to have to sacrifice. He doesn't want us going through religiosity. He says obedience is better than all that gunk and the religion and the sacrifices. And so as Christians, if we're truly his children, little Christ-like people, learning of Christ, learning what he's doing and how he does it, looking at the word of God and aligning our life to that instead of living in disobedience and rebellion. As we start maturing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what we're predestined to become more and more like Jesus, to be conformed to his image, not be conformed to the world's image but to the image of the only begotten, beloved Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. So when we forsake that, we stop growing in that. We, we tend to go back to the old ways we want Egypt again. We start complaining and murmuring and becoming rebellious and idolatrous. 
and violating the, the, the covenant, then we're upset when eventually the curses are coming upon our life because we've stepped out of the protective covering of the Lord and opened up the doors to Satan to come in and we step out into his environment under his rule of rebellion and disobedience, the spirit of disobedience that works now in the children of disobedience. That kind of stuff brings about havoc in our personal life, our families, our churches, and in the world. Israel was powerful and was defeating the enemies. But one man chose to violate what God said to do, and Israel lost the battle. There was sin in the camp, God said. And God exposed the man and what he had done. And that man and his family had to pay the consequences in order for the whole congregation, for Israel to survive and be able to go forward because it was stopped. It was defeated. See, that's what happens in churches. And, and we need to realize that when sin's allowed to abound in the church, we're, we're no longer able to defeat the enemy, but we're defeated. And the enemy's taking advantage against us and our children and our relationships and our businesses and our work and our, our economics. And every area of our life begins to be challenged at some point or another. Now, that is not popular North American theology, but that's what's written in the book. And it was written for our example that we'd learn not to do what Israel did, to know what the consequences for our actions would be. See, we brought up a generation that doesn't believe in consequences for our action. David committed adultery and had the, the man murdered, really. He was forgiven. Yay, we can sin like David now. We can go have adultery and murder and be forgiven. David repented. But there were consequences. The sword and bloodshed never departed from David's house. That was God saying, that's the consequence that's coming upon you and your house. And it happened from generation to generation, right up to Messiah, the shedding of his blood, which was good for us. But that was the fulfillment of the consequences for David's house. And when you and I violate God's word, we may be forgiven, but there may be consequences that go on for long term. And those are the problems that people don't want to take into consideration. A young couple, before they were married, had sexual relations and a child was conceived. They came to the Lord. I'm sure he forgave them. They prayed prayers of repentance. But the baby was born, and the baby was a challenge in their life. All through their life, that child was a challenge. Perhaps it had not have been conceived in, in the wrong way. There's, the child's spirit may not have been damaged in, from the womb out. I don't know. But there are consequences. Babies are born like Ishmael was a problem and still is a problem. Angry and hurt with Israel for perceived injustices as well as maybe injustices. But there's problems in the world today. And that happened thousands of years before. Consequences for our actions. You know, people don't like the consequences. They often get mad at God for their consequences. People get mad at law enforcement because they get caught doing something as if it was law enforcement's fault for their wrongdoing or like it's God's fault that they got called short and they're having now curses in their life because they opened up their, their life to destruction instead of blessing. But it's God's fault. And so they're angry at God. And they become atheists often. Well, the choices are ours. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the Lord? Or are you going to serve yourself in the world? 
Learn from Israel. Get out of that idolatry. Come back to the one true God and him alone. Love him with all of your heart, with all your might, with all of your soul and all your being and strength. And learn to love others, even as you would like to be loved. And then you can fulfill the blessings of God's law that never have gone away. They're to be fulfilled in Christ working in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory, working mightily. But see, he has to be king of your life. He has to be the Lord of your life. Can't just be savior. He needs to be the Lord to bring you through and to finish and complete the work that he starts in your life for your benefit and for your loved ones and for the nations of the world. They need to see the discipleship and maturity of Christ within you growing instead of the rebellion. Learn from the mistakes of others. That's what wise people do. But foolish people will not learn. Even though they get beaten over and over and over, they still continue down the same path of insanity, doing the same thing, hoping for a different result. Well, this is Pastor Dan encouraging you. Learn from the history of Israel and others. And don't repeat their mistakes and their sins. Learn to trust the Lord in all of your ways. Commit them unto the Lord before you do them so that he can correct you before you make the mistakes. That could cost you a lifetime of pain and destruction. Blessings.